For Creamer Media's Polity, I'm Sash Nimadi. Joining me today is best-selling author Dennis Hassan, here to discuss his latest book, My 30-Minute Bar Mitzvah. So you're right that being Jewish was a secret that you couldn't crack, and that even if you were curious about it, you buried that curiosity. Can you tell us why? I think this was something that I picked up from my parents without really realizing it. I think that the Jews generally have wanted to melt into the landscape, not be too visible. There was a lot of anti-Semitism in South Africa, especially in the 1920s, 1930s, even 1940s. And even after that, and even in my life growing up, I experienced rather mild forms of anti-Semitism, but people did let me know that they knew that I wasn't exactly like them. In my personal case, my grandparents, all of them escaped violence against Jews in Russia and Latvia. And I think this idea of not coming openly out into the world as a Jew was something that was absolutely inbred. It wasn't something I even thought about so much. And I would like to add that when my mother saw the title of this book, My 30 Minute Bar Mitzvah, she said to me, you can't have that as a title. So I said, really? She said, yeah, it's a chutzpah. The word chutzpah means it's a nerve. But what she, you mean, she meant you've got a nerve. But what she really meant was, don't come out into the open about being Jewish because it's not done. So this is a kind of coming out, to use a title like that. You also say that being Jewish was one thing and having something to do with Israel was another. How so? Everything was, for me, was divided into little boxes. I had grandparents here in Joburg who were not really deeply black practicing Jews at all, but my grandfather went to synagogue every Friday evening. I had my parents who were not interested in speaking a word about their identity as Jews, who were rather humanists, atheists. My father, as you know, was a political activist. And then Israel was where my mother's parents lived. And I hadn't seen them until I was, what, nearly nine years old. Uh, and that was another exotic place. Those mysterious people I'd never seen, but whom my mother received letters from in a language which I didn't understand, which was Yiddish. So it was little boxes, little boxes in a context where really we didn't think. I mean, who thinks as a child of their identity? Who thinks they're really South African? Who thinks they're... I mean, if kids were going to synagogue every Saturday. Of course they're thinking about being Jewish, but I wasn't. I was having, I'd had a secular existence out in the long grass looking at insects, you know. That was my thing. Living in South Africa and in England, your parents were in contact with those who were in exile um, and involved with the anti-apartheid struggle. Did you understand at the time, you know, as a kid, what your parents were involved with? Did you ever question them about it? I think that's a very good question. What does a child exactly understand growing up? I've asked myself this question many times. After the 21st of March 1960 and the Sharpeville massacre, when I was eight, going on nine, what did I actually absorb of what was going on? I knew that something had happened. I knew that my father was in a state. I knew that we went to see people. I went with him because I traveled everywhere with him. I was a puppy dog. I traveled everywhere with him. And they talked. And they went into another room and they closed the door. I often was in houses with closed doors and I was on the other side of them. And they talked. I had seen the newspapers and I'd seen photographs. But it's so difficult to know what I really knew, but I absorbed the energy of it all. I, absor I absorbed the energy of crisis, disaster, and that something must be done. I think I sort of, that was a, mess a subliminal message, something must be done. 
but I don't think I understood very much. And also, if I was the same person I am today, and I believe that children are the adult in seed form, I'm not a political animal, really. And um, I don't know how much political information I really would have picked up with my, you know, long grass brain of mine. I don't know. Your household wasn't a religious one, as you've said, but while in school, you decided to pray to the Lord. Uh, but this was difficult for you to do. Why? I certainly didn't pray because anyone in our house was praying. Uh, and it didn't last that long, this period. And I can't really tell you. I liked chanting the Lord's Prayer in the hall of our school. I liked singing the hymns. Maybe it wasn't a specifically religious part of my being, but rather wanting something just beyond the everyday. I liked listening to the black woman who was polishing our stoop singing a lot. I mean, I liked it a lot, and she was singing a lot. A mystery. A mystery, but it's true that that is something that is consistent in me now, that I like what is beyond the everyday. I like the details of the everyday and what goes beyond them. Where it goes exactly is another question. In 1964, your father was sentenced under the Sabotage Act. How did that affect you as a child? Because you say in the book that at the time, politics meant nothing more than personal loss. That's what it was. My father was the person I loved most in the world. And suddenly he was gone. This, uh, the image that's come to me often is a house that goes down in a sinkhole, you know, and there was a house there and then there was nothing, a void. Something close to death. I was just at puberty, just when children sometimes begin thinking of death. My father's absence was a kind of death to me. Then there was what happened between us, which I don't want to speak about. It's a mystery, it's a mystery in the book, secret. It was terrible to me. It was terrible, but it's taken me all these years to tell myself that it really was trauma, that I was traumatized. My first instinct, I think, was just to say, um, We'll just carry on and nothing has, nothing has happened that's going to stop me from going on living. But that meant I couldn't really embrace the despair and the loss and the utter sadness of it all. Yeah, not at that moment. Years later, as an adult, you visited Constitution Hill, which was the site of the Old Fort Prison where your father was held. Um, with the feelings that you had towards your father uh, for his struggle activities, what was that moment like for you at Constitution Hill? Firstly, I did not plan to go back to Constitution Hill. In fact, it seems to me that most of the important events in my life have not been planned. I went because a photographer wanted to photograph me in a prison cell. I took my wife and my children and I left them at the cafe in the courtyard and I went into the cells and the first thing was that my stomach tightened. I, like, I was in a state of, I was just a, a sh my body turned into a shield and I wasn't, I was breathing extremely shallowly and I was, I think I went into a shell actually, like you know one of those snails that just or a tortoise, just don't want to be there. And at the same time, it was good that I was there, that I'd actually seen what the cell looked like. Because when my father was arrested, I could not think of him in a prison. I couldn't say to myself, um, there was a space with bars and who knows what else inside it. It just, my sense of him and his presence stopped at the prison gates, which I'd seen on several occasions. Um, I'd 
gone to Witz, walked past the fort, but I couldn't get in there. I didn't want to get in there. I didn't want to fully take it on because I had already fully taken it on and I didn't want to acknowledge that I'd fully taken it on. So it was part of breaking through the denial of it. In fact, you could say that going back into that space that was the beginning of the writing of this book, in a way, in a way, perhaps. It's the first time I've said that, but perhaps it's true. Or perhaps you could say that it was his arrest that was the beginning, but um, it was an important moment for me, physically, physically, because as I said with respect to, for example, Scharfel, the body remembers. The body remembers what's going on even if the brain doesn't fully process it. Yeah. Did your daughter's bar mitzvah feel like a full circle moment for you given how your own had turned out all those years ago? No, it didn't feel like that. It felt as if we were doing something that I thought was important. I'm a ritualist. I'm not a practicing Jew. Mm -hmm. I'm not a practicing anything. I'm just a practicing human being. But I'm also a ritualist. And I believe that above all at the rites of passage, birth and puberty and marriage and death, it's important to have a ritual. So it was important for us, my wife and I, to have a ritual when our children reached puberty. And we were lucky to find someone who was going to do a secular bar mitzvah. I'm not going to go into the details, they're in the book, but um, everything that this man did with that group of children made sense. It made sense to the children. It wasn't just a blind, thing that they went through because somebody had told them to do so, they actually were fully engaged and that was somewhat miraculous, I think. And that's what I got involved in. I got involved in a real meaningful ritual with my daughter, which strangely boomeranged back straight in my face because she told me what she thought my father should not have done and I had to deal with that. Was that also one of the reasons that you wrote the book? Ultimately, yes. It was quite a few years before, but it certainly turned into material for the book. But I never sat down, and I never have sat down in any of my nine books and said, OK, I'm now going to write a book like this. Okay. But that's how it happened. It was deep nourishment, what she said to me and her whole being through that process. And indeed, also my son going through the same process five years later, but it wasn't particularly important in the context of what had happened to me be because it happened differently. Mm -hmm. But he also went through the ritual and that too was important to me as an affirmation of Jewishness. Why not? That's what we are. And today, have you come to terms with your Jewishness? Yes, I think so. I used to imagine that there was an ancestor inside me, and he used to be this rather fierce, bearded man, looking over my shoulder, asking me why the hell I wasn't going to synagogue when other boys my age were, and, uh, or other people. And uh, he, would, he would be the keeper of the law, in a way. And now I still have an ancestor inside me, but he's uh, a strangely forlorn young man and he's trailing after me and he's wearing black and he's unshaven and uh, yeah, he doesn't bother me so much, but he's still there. That was best-selling author Dennis Hassan discussing his book, My 30 Minute Bar Mitzvah.